the world to come. The Restored Church of God presents David C. Pack. This is part four about the Trinity. Having covered the history of this popular belief, there is much more to understand. Before proving the Bible does not support the Trinity, we must examine the logic the confusion in human reasoning that produced the Trinitarian argument, and how it became so widely accepted. Follow carefully, readying for disbelief and outright shock at what people are expected to swallow about the three-in-one God. Professing Christianity is broken into thousands of denominations and sects. This is because beliefs vary so widely. Every church seems to have its own pet beliefs where it is willing to diverge from all others. One exception is found in almost every branch of Christendom, belief in the triune God. It is practically the only teaching that links every church, from Baptists to Catholics, Anglicans to Presbyterians, Methodists to Lutherans, even many Sabbath keepers, all worship the Trinity. How central is it? Many scholars believe the doctrine of the Trinity is the most crucial element in the Christian understanding of God. Ask, could thousands of disagreeing, competing denominations, divergent in so many beliefs, somehow manage to reach the correct answer on the Trinity? Has Christianity somehow been able to correctly identify the right foundation, the true God of the Bible, yet only found confusion atop that foundation. Could all these churches disagree on basically every doctrine, yet unanimously stumble upon the truth about God? The answer, an obvious no. An even greater question arises. If all these churches were serving the correct God, why has he left them so divided about the many truths of his word? More new denominations only worsen it. The true God is not the author of confusion. He commands all his followers to worship him in spirit and in truth. To do this, one must understand who and what he is. This means first learning what he is not. The Bible shows this world is cut off from the true God. Yet we saw God's word declares there is a God of this world. This cut-off condition is why we will discover an amazing lack of understanding in a series of quotes from those attempting to explain the Trinity. You will also see why the triune Godhead is dangerous. We saw this theory is embedded in ancient philosophy. But how was the Trinity explained so that the masses would accept it? How exactly was it taught so lay people would believe it? The difficulty in explaining the Trinity has engendered many schools of thought, many types of Trinitarian godheads. You must understand the logic, the reasoning used to sell the triune God for 17 centuries. Straight from Trinitarians, we will see how they describe their God and how their greatest belief is blind faith. Their explanations defy logic and are usually so convoluted they are hard to read. Debunking their faulty reasoning will serve as important setup to why the Trinity is unbiblical. We will break down supposed definitions and expose the error, and show how arguments lack even the most basic logic and are the source of the confusion. You will find astonishing how little the Bible is referenced. Since God is not working with the world at large, since it is cut off from him, it follows that the world would be cut off from his understanding. Jesus prayed, I thank you, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hid these things from the wise and prudent, and have revealed them unto babes. The wise and schooled of this world just cannot understand God. Yet the truth about the real God of the Bible can be easily understood by the average person if God has opened his or her mind. Would the creator of the universe command, you shall have no other gods before me, and leave it to human reasoning to determine who he is? God's word plainly shows that man by himself is not capable of understanding spiritual matters. Read these verses. 
God's purpose for mankind can be understood, but not without first deconstructing the house of cards built by the wise and prudent about God's nature. Many profess to believe in the triune Godhead without understanding what it means, how it is defined. The simplest explanation is that God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are three members of the Godhead, coexisting as one being. In essence, God is three separate persons in a single being. Most people declare that God's Word is the source of their beliefs. Remember, the word Trinity appears nowhere in Scripture. This creates an obvious problem, resulting in two schools of thought. One group admits this, but reasons around it. The other forces the Bible to say what it does not. To clarify its mystery, many theologians attempt to explain the Trinity in theological terms. As we read, ask, where is the Bible in their logic? Rest assured, the first quote was not mistyped. I apologize that you must endure such ridiculous nonsense. The doctrine of the Trinity lies in Scripture in solution. When it is crystallized from its solvent, it does not cease to be scriptural, but only comes into clearer view. Or, to speak without figure, the doctrine of the Trinity is given to us in Scripture, not in formulated definition, but in fragmentary allusions. When we assemble the disjecta membra, meaning scattered fragments, into their organic unity, we are not passing from Scripture, but entering more thoroughly into the meaning of Scripture. We may state the doctrine in technical terms supplied by philosophical reflection. I promise some explanations would be painful to read. Such gibberish leaves one almost breathless, dazzled by its sheer confusion. Is this quote a study in Latin? Is it about organic farming? Is it philosophy? Is it mere illusion but in fragments? Is it about mixing paint or about chemistry? Do not laugh at the suggestion of chemistry. You will see why in a moment. More seriously, this asserts that the Bible reveals the Trinity in fragmentary allusions, not plainly. One must use philosophical reflection to deduce what it is. This contradicts verses we have seen. Man on his own cannot see spiritual matters. In fact, our natural thoughts, the Bible says, are hostile to what God teaches. Let's read. The carnal mind is enmity against God. The Greek is hostile to. Spiritual matters must derive from and be explained by the Bible, not the logic of hopelessly confused men. Now a famous quote that combines philosophy, poetry, and prose with a heavy dose of abstract gobbledygook. No sooner do I conceive of the one than I am illumined by the splendor of the three. No sooner do I distinguish them than I am carried back to the one. When I think of any one of the three, I think of him as the whole, and my eyes are filled, and the greater part of what I am thinking of escapes me. When I contemplate the three together, I see but one torch, and cannot divide or measure out the undivided light. What? Was this written by the guy who lit the Olympic torch and then lost his mind? You can't make this up. The next source attempts to use metaphysical concepts to explain God's nature. The essence is not exclusive to only one of these at a time. The essence is not divisible among the distinctions of persons, but indivisible. Again, this makes absolutely no sense. Take heart if you had no idea what it said. It goes further, reducing God to a mere chemical formula and Christianity to a controlled experiment. Notice, it is a fact of chemistry that plain water, when placed in a vacuum under gas pressure of 230 millimeters and at a temperature of zero degrees centigrade, will solidify into ice at the bottom of the container. The liquid will remain in the center, and at the top, it vaporizes. At a given moment, the same water is both solid, liquid, and gas. Yet all three are manifestations of the same base substance, H2O. 
Can't the creator of this substance be Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three persons and one nature as spirit without violating the law of logic or reason? Does the viewer have any doubt God gave men over to minds void of judgment, Romans 1.28, that they could write such nonsense? One obvious big fault with this recipe-style module is that God cannot be defined solely by His creation. Think for a moment. This argument depends on fixed levels of gas pressure and temperature in a vacuum. God, who is spirit, is not restrained or governed by physical scientific laws, chemistry or otherwise. Christ walked through walls, read minds, raised the dead, turned water into wine, walked on water, was himself raised from the dead, and defied gravity. Miracles cannot be explained by human logic or reason. It was God who set into motion all the laws governing the universe, not the other way around. Study Job 38. Again, the Bible declares, The invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead. There are patterns in creation that mirror the spirit world. This is also stated in Corinthians and Hebrews. But completely defining aspects of the spirit realm by the physical world is just not valid. One can understand how God thinks or patterns of the spirit world by things made. For instance, structure-oriented people typically build houses with straight lines and clear rooms. It is their nature to think in that way. Artistically oriented people would include more angles, spaces, and alcoves. This is their nature. To understand how God thinks, His nature, examine His products. He is also a creator. So we can gain insight into Him by examining what He has created. If you look at the laws of nature, they exemplify precision and structure. There is beauty and elegance in the natural world. Everything has a place, so proper order and balance is maintained. This is what can be discerned from creation. This is not what the previous quote said. The writer attempts to define God by a law of science, effectively constraining Him by it. God defines and limits laws. They do not define and limit Him. Now another triune God description. Each esteems and defers to the other in a way that makes the original family of the Trinity a model for the Christian family of believers in the Church. The key to unlocking the mystery of the Trinity is to observe how the persons of the triune family give themselves to one another in selfless love. They are always at one another's disposal. The Father serves the Son, the Son serves the Father. Father and Son defer to the Holy Spirit, who in turn serves and defers to the Father and Son in a oneness that is eternally dynamic and inexhaustible. On the surface, what is actually an absurd comparison feels good, because it appeals to love and family. But reading it logically, it says nothing would ever be done by God. If each person defers to the others, it creates an infinite loop, a kind of never-ending passing of the buck. Like families or corporations, one person must be in charge. In traditional families, the husband-father. In companies, the CEO. Without leaders, There are no decisions made and nothing is accomplished. And without one member of the Godhead leading, there is no creation because everyone is deferring. Carefully scrutinizing statements from theologians shows they appeal to feelings or emotions, not sound analysis, never mind the soundness of Scripture. The last source also claims... All the remaining New Testament books contain Trinity teaching except James and 3 John. The triune family is God's revelation of Himself as the ultimate truth about reality. This family is the original pattern from which God creates all the families of earth with their unity and diversity. The family of mankind, after losing its intimate relationship with the divine family at the fall, is restored to fellowship by God's action. This happens when its members acknowledge the generosity originating in the Father, expressed by the Son, and energized by the Holy Spirit. 
This generates many questions, including, why is a family known for its diversity? What was God's action? What does ultimate truth about reality mean? In no way does the triune Godhead represent the human family. Besides the outright falsehood of the Trinity being all through the New Testament, there is no reality anywhere in the statement. Typical of such statements, this one uses lofty, all-encompassing terms that appeal to vanity. Remember, those who reject God profess themselves wise, Paul wrote. Those hearing such quotes don't want to be seen as little thinkers, so they accept assertions like the ultimate truth about reality when such phrases mean nothing. A methodical analysis shows these statements generate more questions than answers. Don't permit similar ones to mislead you. See through them. Some are so convoluted they seem almost meant to be confusing, meant to be illogical. In the end, most give up and accept them, succumbing to vanity or fear of seeming unintelligent. God commands to prove me now herewith. Also, 1 Thessalonians 5.21 can be rendered, examine everything carefully, hold fast to that which is good. Surely everything includes identifying the true God from all impostors. The Trinity doctrine is never explained in plain English. Instead, concepts such as tritheism, monarchianism, and subordinationism are thrown around. It is a waste of time to address ideas as convoluted and confusing as they sound. Because the Trinity mystery cannot be explained, theologians declare with pride it cannot be understood. Notice. That is to say, it embodies a truth which has never been discovered and is indiscoverable by natural reason. With all his searching, man has not been able to find out for himself the deepest things of God. Yet we have seen God commands we prove him. Vanity causes theologians and scholars to often fancy themselves as having particularly deep minds. In the name of supporting the Trinitarian mystery, there has developed an almost fascination to sign on to it with their own statements that basically declare their ignorance. The process has taken on a life of its own and created a mountain of nonsense one must wade through on the way to nowhere. Now this source, the mind of man cannot fully understand the mystery of the Trinity. He who would try to understand the mystery fully will lose his mind. Remember the guy with the torch whose thoughts escaped him? But he who would deny the Trinity will lose his soul. Consider the implications of the last two quotes. The second adds an even more powerful dimension to, actually an indictment of, those who would try to sort out the Trinitarian convolution instead of docilely accepting it. The writer advises that, rather than studying to find truth, one should just take the word of learned authorities. The problem? These admit they don't know. What a wonderful world for theologians, where honor comes for being ignorant. The Apostle John wrote, Believe not every spirit, but try or test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. The Trinity is entirely related to the spirit realm. Surely this would be the first spirit the seeker of truth would test. Remember, God states, prove me. The Apostle Paul stated, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Also, Christians are promised salvation. Are they never to understand in this life the God with whom they will spend eternity? And God has not given us the spirit of fear. Fear of disagreeing with the Trinity does not come from the true God. But God has given us the spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. If the Holy Spirit brings Christians sound-mindedness, then insanity, to lose his mind, could not possibly result from understanding what God is. Finally, this. As the doctrine of the Trinity is indiscoverable by reason, so it is incapable of proof from reason. Utterly amazing. This pro-Trinity statement says you cannot apply either reason or proof to the subject of God's nature. Quotes like the last two destroy the Trinity's credibility. In the end, 
Trinity advocates become the best proof against it, the very best reason to reject it. More underlying logic problems surface. For instance, assume the Trinity is true. Jesus said, I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. How did the Father send Jesus if they are the same being? Was Jesus speaking poetically? If the Father did not literally send him, meaning Jesus remained inextricably bound with the Father and the Holy Spirit, the verse loses its meaning. Would God expect us to see through what is mere poetic analogy? And how could Christ do the will of his Father if they were the same? Would he not be doing his own will? How would two-thirds of such a Godhead, the Father and Holy Spirit, defer to a pseudo-human Christ while he was on earth for 33 and a half years? And if the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are a single being, how did, how could one-third of one being die? Some have suggested the only conclusion the Trinity permits is that there are two Christs. One, called the glorified psychic Christ, or what could be thought of as a kind of predetermined divine carcass sent to earth to die, and the other, the infinite eternal Christ, who remained locked in the three-in-one Godhead. Two Christs means four beings in the Godhead. Of course, this rhetorical discussion is all ridiculous. In the end, the Trinity requires two Christs, or one-third of one being, found a way to die. Let's go further. To where did Jesus ascend if he were already part of the Trinity? If he had remained in heaven all along, did the one Christ ascend and merge into the other Christ? There is still another problem. How could Jesus now be mediator and high priest in forgiveness of sins if he is one part of a single being, meaning all parts would be in agreement where mercy is required? Christ would be mediating to the other two-thirds of the same mind. And the Bible says Christ sits at the Father's right hand. How does a third of one being sit at the right hand of another third of that same being? How marvelous that such impossibilities can be swept away by, remember, it's a mystery. Don't let Trinitarians convince you to accept outright silliness on faith. The God that has been called a mystery is simply ludicrous, and something reasonable minds, if armed with the facts, would reject. Do you now better understand why Trinitarians declare that to understand this teaching would cause one to lose his mind? They may be right. While all the explanations shown are ridiculous to the point of humorous, there is something sinister hidden within the overall problem of the Trinity. If the only Jesus Christ there is did not actually die, but remained alive within the Trinity, then mankind has no Savior. Paul wrote, the wages of sin is death. Christ had to literally die to satisfy this penalty. Any teaching to the contrary is anti-Christ. Without a Savior, we are all, as Paul wrote, yet in our sins, or still under the death penalty. All have no hope of a future resurrection, and we are of all men most miserable. If this life is all we have to look forward to, we might as well eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die without hope. Toying with who and what God is is a dangerous exercise, one more fraught with problems than most realize. It is human nature to make what is simple complex. Of course, God understood this tendency when he arranged his word. The Bible is written precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little. The ancient Corinthians had fallen into confusing what is simple. Notice, I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. God must supply his servants with plain answers on all matters crucial to salvation. This includes who he is. If he tells his people to prove what they believe, they would never be required to guess at truth, never mind truth so central to Christianity. He would never expect this. Whether and how you and I have a Savior is central, and what God is is central. 
The doctrines of God are simple to understand when all related verses are assembled. There is simplicity in Christ, but there is nothing simple about the Trinity or the Christ within it. Let's ask again. Should there exist this much confusion about something so fundamental? Paul told the true church of God, I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. In light of just this passage, do you still think God or His people tolerates confusion and division? Think. First, God's people are together and perfectly joined together. There is to be no division among them. Reread the verse. This is part of the simplicity in God's way. The believe whatever you want policy of the churches in the world of traditional Christianity does not match 1 Corinthians 1.10. The one church where Jesus Christ is the head is unified on all matters of doctrine, of truth. God's church speaks the same thing all the time and on all points. Next time we will examine supposed biblical proofs, so-called proof texts cited for the Trinity and the scriptures that refute them. In the meantime, you may want to read my full-length book, The Trinity is God, 3 in 1. It covers more than we have time for in this series. Until next time, this is David C. Pack saying goodbye, friends. This program was made available by Restored Church of God members and donors from around the globe. Explore our vast library of literature and other World to Come programs, which are all made available free of charge. To learn more or to find a local congregation, contact us to receive a personal response from a minister.